went on to work with Robert Altman. I'm just looking at the directors more than the actors now. You went on to work with Robert Altman, <laughs> Susanna York, all the rest of the images. What was that like? Uh, was it was easy. It was, uh, it was tough because Robert Altman arrived on the set every morning and said, like, change the scenes, new scenes. And um, on, the, uh, and on Friday, he said to me, uh, well, he, the first assistant came rushing out to me. We, were, we had a table tennis tournament going on with Susanna York, and I was our partner. Yeah. So we were going off to play table tennis, and, um, and uh, next thing the AD called me back and said, Robert Dalton wants to talk to you. So I went back in, he said, I want on Tuesday to blow out this particular actor's stomach, and I'm going to use a double barrel shotgun. So I had to uh, say, right, OK, this is a Friday evening. So I went and checked him in my workshop at the time and said we had enough latex, we hadn't got enough latex. So I rang a colleague of mine, he said he'd see about it. So I decided to go to the production office and order a gross of condoms because I needed the latex as a backup in case I didn't get the, the tins of latex over. So the couldn't production... You exactly buy them over the counter? In the yeah, well, you couldn't buy days. them then because they were illegal, yeah, uh. um, in the 70s. And... Um, so the production secretary at the time rang the production accountant in London on a Friday afternoon late and he had to go out and buy a gross of condoms for me and he got a request to uh, get some uh, underwear for Susanna York. So on his way back, right. on his way back to Dublin, and and he condoms, was apprehended yeah. at the uh, customs in Dublin. The customs asked to open the case and this guy opened the case and seen all the ladies underwear and it, he had to take it out in front of people passing through and then he had to produce the condoms and all that and he was so embarrassed so they threw him in the clink at the, the airport and they had to ring the uh, production office and verify all this it was from, went on for hours and I got a when, uh, when, uh, when he came back to the studios at the time he sent for me and he said to me don't ever ask me to get condoms again did it work by the way? Did the, did yeah, the yeah it worked yeah we, work we, got, we got the shot Right. We got the shot on Tuesday. Tuesday. You know, speaking of getting the shot, an awful lot of it is you get one shot at getting the shot. Because well, all the stuff that you've got, might, you mightn't have it again, and you mightn't be able to use it, or you might be using 5,000 quid's worth every second for you know, two or three minutes. Often is the director trying to say, listen, okay, we're all ready now. It's like, well, hold on a minute, we're actually not. I don't have it ready yet, Buster, so you might have to wait four hours or a day. Have you ever said that? Because you might have had to say that. Well, many times. Many times I've been pushed by directors saying, like, we've got to go, we've got to go, we've got to go. It was like, I remember I did Neil Jordan's first film, Angel. Angel, yeah. And um, it was near where the uh, British ambassador was blown up. And we were right across the road, you know, and there was a bit of a confusion with the police and the special branch and everything. No one knew. They hadn't got the message. They hadn't got the message. The movie. So, yeah. you know, so um, Neil Jordan said to me, we, we've got to go, we've got to go. I just can't wait around. I said, well, we're not going yet until I have fire cover. And we were waiting on these green goddesses to come down. It was a Friday evening at six o'clock in the evening, coming down from Stuck Sandy in Dublin, from, traffic, in Dublin yeah. through traffic. So it was all the police were trying to get them through and everything. So once I seen it coming in the gate, then I fired, I blew up this ballroom at the time, simulators and that. In the meantime, um, five minutes later, there was all these guys jumping around with machine guns, special branch guys. The real deal, yeah. They thought it was the real thing was that happened because apparently the ambassador rang, said to his wife, I'm on my way home. And it was about calculation was roughly where he was going to be when the, uh, when the British ambassador was blown up before. So there was uh, a lot of, they were pushing guns up my nose because they kept saying it's him, it's him. Do you ever think yourself no. <laughs> that's the dumbest place ever to have to do that? I mean, like when you think about what happened with the British ambassador, was it, I don't know, when it was, 76? Was that, that was uh, 70, the, uh, about, I think it was 74. Whatever, yeah. Okay, it was your Great. bigs. And like, why yeah, would yeah. you have to blow up a thing for uh, Angel, for Neil Jordan, right there? Because you don't find it somewhere else. Well, they, I mean, they picked the location, but I did say to them at the time, you know, it was uh, a couple of hundred metres away is where the ambassador was blown up. But, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, ah, it's fine, fine, it's the location. So I'd say, well, did you pick the location. I, I do my job. I notify the security and, and that the security is supposed to notify you the certain security production is supposed to do the same. Well, as far as I was concerned, I did mine, my, my right. bit. Do you care about a reputation that a director might bring, like that other people might be in awe or might be scared? Because you've worked with some of the most fickle kind of characters that I've ever come across in terms of reading about directors in the past. Like, for instance, you work with C uh, Sergio Leone. Now, I don't know how fickle or crazy he is, but I do know he doesn't probably speak English very well. That's one thing, for starters. He had done his dynamite, or his um, 
fistful of movies with Clint Eastwood, etc. So he was like well known. Did that mean anything to you when you met him? I didn't know who he was. <laughs> uh, you know, again, uh, uh, again, sort of. Uh, You're better this, off. This guys uh, were uh, shooting this in a pub, and he said, uh, uh, "You, you, you shoot, you shoot the, the person." I said, "Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm here for. That's my job." So he made me strip off the far as far the bullet hit on my skin. Uh, to show him, and he said, that's fine, I want more blood. I want loads of spaghetti, he said. So we got the shot and that, but then I realised I heard who he was. I said, well, great, I've worked with him as well. And what about the guys you were working with on the movie? There was Rod Steiger on that one, wasn't there? There was Rod Steiger, there James was Coburn, James Coburn, yeah. and um, I think, I'm not sure whether Clint Eastwood. How was James Coburn? Was he cool? He was fine, grand, just what <laughs> am I doing, you know? Did, a lot of these actors, a lot of these actors, uh, uh, experience and seasoned actors and actresses is great. It's sometimes you have the problems in some of the actresses or actors coming up the way, sort of like you want to be the belle of the ball, you know. It, it, it happened in when we were doing um, Barry Lyndon with Stanley Kubrick. Ryan O'Neill was coming through, a big actor at the time and that. And he always, uh, a lot of the Irish actors were great and Kubrick really loved the Irish actors at the time. They were, delivered the lines, acted well. But with Ryan, it was always like, how do I do, Stanley? How do I do? Yeah, fine. What do you mean, fine? You, you know, you tell everyone else that they look great, but if you don't tell me, I ever look great. It was always, so it was always that little thing that you meet these particular guys. Or and would Kubrick do every shot 400 times? Every scene? Uh, yes, uh, he'd all the time. And if we had to, if, we, if, he, if he wasn't happy with a set, it was like, change it, I don't like it. That's what he did. He just You've got a throwaway line in the book, which is brilliant about it. Kubrick when he's taking his soup. Oh yeah. Dribbling down his beard, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I was at the finishing a film called uh, Zardus with Sean Connery, yeah. and a guy called Bernie Williams is the producer and said to me, look, I really want you to do a movie. So when I said to Bowman at the time, he said to me, no, hold on, I'm not finished the film yet, I want to do another week or two. So he held me on. So they got a, an English uh, uh, guy, and then he got a crew together, and they came over. And when I finished on the film, I went, and I. I start showing Kubrick uh, effects. So he asked, I was asked to take over the movie and the rest of the guys got, just went back to England at the time. And um, at the time, as, um, he, I went out to set the scene one day because if you went on the set and you weren't involved, you were fired. So you had to have a reason to be on the set. Yeah. You know, and you couldn't visit on it. So it was one day, a particular day, we were, I said, decided because we're going to do a big tracking scene in the movie. And he, I, I said to him, Stanley, I have so many, Things going to do so many explosions, fires, and everything like that. And he was like that, drinking his soup with a beard, and the, the soup was going down his beard, and he, and he was doing rubbing it in his beard, and he just said, "Travel it." <laughs> and that's all he said to me. And then after that, I got on great with him, you know. <laughs> because uh, well, like, he's like he was a bit of a centric kind of, you know, Stanley. Was he now? Mm. But they all are. I mean, like <laughs> I noticed the way when you mentioned John Borman for the first time in the last ten minutes, you said. Borman. Let's be perfectly honest. I hope he's not here because I know he lives down in Animo. Anyway, um, you didn't like him at first, did you? No, we had a run in the first time. Um, it was a problem we had. We were doing a shot where there's all uh, uh, this uh, bread, like uh, what French this, sticks. Was this Zardos? That was Zardos, right, yeah. yeah. That was the first film. And, uh, it, you know, was, I was at the camera. I always stay at the camera, you know, so as I can see what's going on myself. and. Um, and they always like to be sort of standing. So you can see if it works. I can see if it works. Where the audience might see it. Where the audience are going to be looking at us and that. So I like to stay at the camera. And one particular uh, scene we were doing was all the steam coming through these tubes, hundreds of tubes and that. And um, whatever happened, it broke down. So uh, Bowman uh, said, um, what's, what's the problem? I said, no, no, it's like, I'll see. You know? So I went around the back and uh, there was a remark passed about, about the effects. You know, so what happened was the generator spiked. It was a surge of power, blew the fuses in the machines. And I, we didn't know that because at behind the scene, all the guys, my crew and electricians were trying to find out what went wrong. Yeah. But there was a remark passed about, about me at the time. And you and didn't like that. And I did didn't you? like that. I don't, I don't care who the, whether it's the biggest director or whatever it is, it's, I, I don't care. I'll just challenge them. So I challenged them at the time and I just said, I want an apology. And they just, Went on. I just said to him, the first assistant director said, if he hasn't given me an apology by four o'clock, I'm gone. Pulling my crew and my equipment off the film. So Al, he, he didn't apologize, but he said, look, okay, this is movie making and that. 
um, and we kind of got on well. And then after that, we just got on like a house and fire. Yeah, and you worked together. Again. We worked together on many movies. We were there with Burman, with Burman and uh, to get back to Stanley Kubrick, it was before Barry Lynn's and anything, before he, was, he had done it. And he's on the phone, and you pick up the phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. You say, it's some guy called Kubrick, kind of thing or something. Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was passing by, and I picked up the phone, like, in the, on the stage. And uh, this guy said, can I speak to uh, John Borman? And I said, can I ask who's speaking? And he said, Stanley Kubrick. And again, I didn't know who he was at right. the time. So I, I said, uh, right, OK, can I ask what's the connection? I would just say, it's Stanley here. Like, you know. So I went to Borman, who was doing a shop with Sean Connery. And he just said, look, tell him I'm busy. I'll, you know, I'm busy, I'll call him back. So I just went back to Borman. I said, look, he's very busy, he'll call you back. So I just happened to be going out the door again. What a coincidence. And someone said, there's a guy called Kubrick on the phone. So I said, oh, OK, I'll take so. Anyway, I took up the phone. So I went back to John and said to uh, John, I said, he said, oh, tell him I'm, I'm busy. I'll, I'll ring him back. And, I, and the penny dropped to me then. This is a guy coming into Ireland about doing a big movie called Barry Lyndon. So I was a bit more polite this time. I said, I'm very sorry, sir. Really, were you now? He's not here. And I ended up working with him. Yeah, exactly. OK, but like if you think about like the way you went from that, Zardos to Barry Lyndon, which is um, 23rd century to 18th century. Mm. Is that just the nature of the gig? Like, everything is just, it doesn't matter what it is. Do you care about what the music, uh, what the movie is? I don't care, yeah. as long as it's work. Right. <laughs> it's just the gig that you have it's to do. It's just a gig. It's like The gig that you have to do, what? The gig that, that, that they say they want you to do, or the gig that you think you have to do? Like, I, your man has now said what he wants, but I know what he really wants. Is that the way you look at it? Well, uh, you're suppose, in charge. I'm yeah, I'm part. in charge. I mean, basically, as I, I get the script, I break it down, read it, yeah. see what it's all about, whether it's uh, 18... Oh, really? You, you look at the script, Oh, you? yeah, I read the script and break it down, see what the effects is going to be. Then I, then I sort of... Uh, then I talk to the uh, production designer, the art director, and then I talk... I always like talking to the director because what the director sees and perceives is maybe totally different yeah. than what the art Do they usually know what they want, or do they just trust you, the art department, and everything else, perhaps? The well, ones? you know, I mean, a good, good production designers have, you know, a well-established person has, you know, done a lot of this maybe before, same as myself, so we, we kind of have a good idea of what it's all about. But, um, yes, sometimes directors don't know what they're talking about. I say that way because, like, I met a bunch of directors sometimes, like, you know, I think half the time they don't know what they're talking about. But you have worked with the biggest directors that you can possibly work mm. with, every one of them right across the board. Mm. So I'm just wondering, are these guys as good for the whole vision of a movie? Well, I think uh, the, the, the guy is most, the, the guy I've seen, which is a master of his craft, of Spielberg, he knows, he, he knows so much about effects. Does he? He does, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he gets into it and he talks to you about it and how will that be? And he'd say, yeah. Well, I don't see blood in this. I want to see f dust coming off the hits, which, you know, very seldom a director will ever ask you that. Um, Were you involved big time in Curra Clow Beach for saving by Curra Clow, I was only involved in the first half hour, you know. Which, that's the most talked about half hour in movies. Well, the well it was. Movie. And it was, uh, at the time, it was great because it was, uh, there was uh, four supervisors on it. We had different areas to work at. Yeah. And and that and um, it was it was uh, in actual fact the adrenaline was running through you when you were when it was the first shot up was a master shot of all the amphibious craft coming and in. And you feel and you're on more attention. Oh like yeah, Steven Spielberg is in well, it's like, it, it, in it's like, like like you know, it's like the minute you touch those buttons are firing. Yeah. You've got to look all around you, wait for your cues, you've got to take the cues yourself. And we're talking rain, we're talking sea, we're talking shots, we're talking fire, we're talking everything that you were doing there. Yeah, everything. We were creating explosions in the water, we were creating bullet hits in the water, which again we used, uh, we, the bullet hits on you see in the movie, the bullet hits were shot in a tank where we were firing bullets and air through and all of that to get the effect, yeah. and which was... Uh, uh, which is which is look very realistic when That's what I'm saying. The, like the power of the way the shots seem to hit on the mm. screen, and the awfulness that after five minutes. And you, I, I remember going to the movie. I was told the first half hour was like this. Say another twenty minutes. This, like I'm not going to take it. It was really heavy stuff. The noises you got when the bullet goes through the water and all that kind of thing. Is that you? Yeah, that's us. I mean, we we, we rigged the whole beach. We rigged the whole beach with uh, a lot of compressed air, yeah. and then we'd have we'd have uh, elect electric. Little, uh, uh, manif little manifolds and we'd have all sort of little valves, electric valves that had let off sort of a gush of air under huge pressure. So you'd see this through yeah. 
and you'd see just a gush of air looks like a bullet that's going through the water and that. And a lot of the stuff, the detailed stuff of the bullets was done in a little tank back in the UK. But most of the time we did the explosions on the beaches, yeah. uh, fires, ex blown up people. Uh, and there was one particular part when we, it was the, one of the big scenes where it was the, the, main, the main shot, master shot, where they all arrive on the beach. And it was so realistic. And it was even some of the guys that were in the Second World War, veterans were crying behind. And we felt it as well. And it was, when it was all cut, there was a hush. Yeah. And you could hear sobbing and, and that. And I felt like the adrenaline was running through me. To well, I felt the guys stop. puking on the thing were puking for real. Oh, yeah, they were real. I mean, that's what happened as well as when the soldiers were taken out in the boats. Uh, they had no water. Uh, they weren't given any food and they were dehydrated. But that's what Kubrick, or that's what he want, um, Spielberg wanted to see, you yeah. know, so this thing. I mean, these guys, maybe the army were never out in the boat before. Uh, terrified. And, yeah, and then for but it was a great shot at the end, at, the, at that particular uh, scene where we did that shot, where uh, there was silence, and then Kubrick asked for, um, uh, Spielberg asked for a uh, bullhorn, and, and um, he just, he got on it and he just said, like, you, you guys can fight for my country any day, he said, I'm absolutely proud of you guys, right. and that was the Irish Army, yeah. you know, and, uh, and the FCA, and because all those guys were coming off brave heart. So they had a huge experience. And a bit, I mean, these guys were telling Mel Gibson how to direct. If guys come over yeah. to Ireland and look for stuff like that, like, I want the Irish Army here, I want armoured vehicles here, I want this, that and the other, can they get them for any big movies at the point? Like, if you go to Morocco, they hand you over all these things in a the minute, any horses you want, etc. No, just, uh, yeah. I, I, I find here, sort of, you know, as over the years, as to say, going back over the years, it was much easier years ago, when, we, when I yeah. started the visit. You just, it was like one guy, he, he would... He would talk to each department, government department, and he had tremendous clout. Some of the Irish government, you mean? Yes, the Irish government. Yeah. But nowadays, it's like, you know, so you have to go to that department, yeah, to go yeah, to that department. Yeah. And the government is not really interested. In yeah. they, they are, they say they are in, in film. But I always say it was the same as a lot of the films we shot Braveheart uh, into the West, uh, as, um, Ryan's Daughter. It brings in tourism, you know? And that's a huge, I mean, huge Dingle, thing for this huge country. Huge tourism to Dingle for Ryan's daughter. Huge yeah. tourism doing for Far and Away with Tom Cruise. That's right. And um, apparently now is they're going to build a village back there again for tourism back in in in, um, in Dingle outside Dingle. But again, we need the government because if you go to other countries, you go to Morocco, they go in to give you a package. You want twenty thousand horses. You want five thousand horses. You want arms. You want the army. You want the navy. You want helicopters. You just get it. That's it. It's like the American system. You know, you, you go to America and you give your script to the department, and they have people who will sort of organise it for you. Here, it seems to be sort of like you know, you're beating your head against the wall all the time. It's same if I want to do, if I want to apply for to import any pyrotechnics, I've got to ask them six or eight weeks beforehand. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't shouldn't take that long. No. You know, it's people who has a track record, people, it's bringing in money, not to be holding up productions. You know, there's a lot of, mo a lot of movies would come in here tomorrow, but it's a terrible like, bureaucracy goes on. You mentioned it's in the book, just to get back to kind of stars for a second. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, on, on Saving Private Ryan, um, what's his name, Tom Hanks. Tom Stanford. Hanks. You, there you are having your meal, this guy sits down beside you, it's Tom Hanks, and he's 41 that day. He was 41, yeah, yeah. And then you had a big party in a tent. He had a big party. Well, we used to, we, were, we used to break at different times uh, and that, and we sort of, some of the crew would stay on during lunch and get things ready for after lunch and that. Uh, so I, did, I took it that I'd take the first break and I was on the first break and that. So I was sitting on my own with um, another one or two guys beside me and the rest of us, nobody beside and facing that. And a guy came, this guy came up and he said to me after the first day, he said, do you mind if I sit down here? Steven Spielberg said it to me and then we got talking. And then he said, uh, I have a little uh, surprise party here, he said today. And I said, oh really? And the uh, next thing is a big cake came along. And Tom Hanks just happened to come in at the same time mm -hmm. and it was a surprise uh, party for him. And I was happy to be there and it was a great privilege.